um, I'm going to explain what's going to happen. We're going to have half an hour where we're going to have a chat. Uh, now normally panels, you know, it's a question, 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 but we've got such an amazing group of ladies here who we've already been having a fabulous chat uh, before everyone got here, so we're going to keep chatting. We actually have got some questions that we will address as we chat, but I want that to be the first half an hour. And then the next 20 minutes will be Q&A for you to ask whatever questions you like. Now, I'm not sure, did everybody get a piece of paper as they came in explaining what uh, website to log on to if you want to put your Q&A, your questions up? So I'm just going to quickly go over it. The URL is slido.com, so S-L-I-D-O dot com. I think it's up on the walls too if you, if you want to look. Um, and then you just get that into your phone internet browser, then the code is N848. N848. Now again, that's up on the wall. So it's a fabulous piece of software where you can think of a question that you'd like to ask. It goes up to the cloud and then everyone can see it. If you'd like to be anonymous, you can do it anonymously. Um, and then people will vote. And the top voted questions we will ask in that 20 minutes. Um, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's get started. So we started talking this morning about how we got into science, technology and innovation and the, the paths. And, and paths can be very unique and yet have similarities. I thought we'd maybe start, should we start, Eleanor, with you and you talk sure. about your path and why you chose <coughs> science. Um, so my challenge is that I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, and in fact, I managed to, to uh, engage in entire confected conversations with grown-ups as a kid when they asked me exactly that. And so I have variously professed an interest in accounting. Yeah. Um, uh, being an astronaut, although that one was real, genetic engineering um, and astrophysics. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, what I was doing was reaching for the things that I knew that I was good at, which was science and maths. So oh. that's how I kind of got on this journey. And I still don't know. And what um, drives me uh, in my career is making a difference. Mm -hmm. So I'll just keep doing that. Yes. You know, what's, what's interesting is that um, a lot of young people, are, you know, they're asked, what do they want to do and how, what can you do with, with STEM? And yet, really, you can do anything with STEM, which is sort of what, what you found. Correct. Yeah. 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 So, Michelle, do you want to talk about? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think I would have had a fairly traditional uh, upbringing, but I realised I think at the age of thirteen, I remember very distinctly sitting on the school bus, going to school, thinking, "I really love physics. Mm -hmm. I really love mm -hmm. it. I just, I just want to do physics." And then people have asked me why, and I think it's because I always like to understand the way the world yeah. works. Mm -hmm. And I figured out um, that I loved English and I loved mm. history. I said, I like to describe things in words. Mm. I love to understand it mathematically and the mm. power of those two I found amazing. Mm. But then as I've got older, I've actually found design yeah. and visual understanding mm. of the world has come into that. So for me, it's like being everything that I love in one subject, but mm. really trying to understand things and create new things. That's what's mm. really got me into it. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. So you've, you've demonstrated that you can think of one thing, but then these other things get joined yeah. onto it, like a, bit like a snowball. Yeah, mm -hmm. just, I, I just, yeah, just following what you really love at any one time. Yes, yes. That's what I've really found. Is, yes. you know, so I never knew what I was going to be. I yes. never knew where it would end. Yeah, yeah. But every, every stage, just following what I love. Following your passion, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, Dharmika, have you had a similar experience, or what, what's yeah. your experience been? I think so. It just came naturally, science, um, especially biology. That was my favourite. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just about understanding how things work again, but in the human sciences. Um, and it was also problem solving and curiosity that got me there. So mm -hmm. I was always like that as a, a, a youngster and then it just amplified and then science was a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time I got to the point where I was like, oh yeah, I think I'm really good at this and I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It was one of those things where I understood that, and it took me a while to understand how powerful um, it was to be in science, but mm -hmm. I knew that at least I could contribute something to the society and that's pretty much what drove me to mm -hmm. stick with it. Mm. So that's uh, another thing that's coming through is the contribution, yeah. uh, you know, wanting to, to have yeah. an impact yeah. and uh, you know, what can you do with your science to have an impact and, and change the world and I know Cathy you've done a lot of that, so what was you, where, where did you decide that science yeah. was for you? Um, I think it was when uh, I was going to be a school teacher and yeah. I actually trained, got my dick mm. But it was when I was uh, at the end of my HSC in schooling, I think coming from a Catholic background, I was sort of had this great Catholic guilt, mm -hmm. which uh, had this requirement to save the world in some way. Mm -hmm. And I was working with uh, Mother Teresa nuns in Burke at the end mm -hmm. of my um, high school. Everyone else was going off to schoolies and I went to Burke. Mm -hmm. And I found it incredibly frustrating that of working at the at the coalface, which is really important, people need to do that. 
but I wanted to change the system. Yeah. And yeah. I found that science was my pathway to do that, apart yeah. from the fact I can't spell write very well all that. You can learn. <laughs> but I, um, I was naturally good at maths and science and always curious about it. But it was this opportunity to, um, to sort of see how you can do things that do change the world. Mm -hmm. And once you start doing a little bit of it, and even at university doing a, a science experiment in a, a sort of open-ended course which I was doing, which said, I'm doing something no one else has ever done before, mm -hmm. it was on liquid crystals or something, uh, that uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, addictive that you think, wow, I can do something mm -hmm. which leads to new knowledge mm -hmm. and then that knowledge can actually lead to something else and it may not be me doing all the work, but someone mm -hmm. does and, and I've had so many opportunities to mm -hmm. be part of something that's been much bigger and changed our world. Mm -hmm. That's interesting from the perspective of it being collaborative, of other people experience mm -hmm. that and is that something that you enjoy about the science? Yeah. Absolutely. I, mean, I think I, all throughout my career, I think when I was quite young, everyone has a kind of view that science is a kind of an individual subject. They're mm. living by themselves, mm. doing their own little experiments. But actually, the power is working with others mm. and sharing ideas. Mm. And I think, you know, one of the things I think is great about Australia is it's hugely collaborative. It's yeah. one of the reasons I came here. Yeah. Big projects all working together, mm. working internationally. Mm. And it's that, you know, getting ideas from other people mm. that's really quite powerful. Mm. Yeah, we're in an interesting part of the world geographically, aren't we, for that perspective? So we have a whole, you know, in, in the UK, probably the US and Europe that you collaborate with, but here yeah. um, there's opportunities for different collaborations which will mean different impacts. Yeah, um, I think you actually have to work at it here, So, you, yeah. but you get to choose it, yeah? Mm. So mm. I know when I was in England, everyone was coming through the whole time. There was a lot of information coming through and I mm. found it too much. Yeah. Whereas mm. Australia is a little bit removed, you can choose what you want to absorb <laughs> yeah. and you can be a bit more strategic about it. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, multidisciplinary, I think. Oh, yes. um, so you know, you'd find that in your work because mm -hmm. you've got your mass spectrometry as well as your biochemistry. Yeah, and we need software engineers, we need engineer engineers, like we need everybody across the board, um, you know, and people that have different skills and, and, and the ecosystem, as they call it, the STEM ecosystem, mm. has to be in there helping us because we can't do it on our own mm. and we're mm. resource limited. Mm. So, yeah. Which is something I think we forget about when we, we think about mm. people doing mm. science. We forget that actually it's great. You can, actually, you can specialise in one thing, but then you actually get the opportunity to mm. work with others as well. So on your journey, have you found um, any, any challenges uh, that you had to get over? And if you did, oh, no, no. how did you? <laughs> <laughs> A leading question, yeah. Um, and you know, how did you overcome those? All right, I'll go first. Um, so so I'll, I'll admit I have attempted to leave STEM and the university sector uh, many times, and mm. you can tell I've dismally failed. Um, uh, and a lot of it comes down to um, again, this this issue of because I'm you know, I'm not driven by a guiding passion. I've always wanted to be blah. Mm -hmm. What that means is I'm motivated by being able to make a difference. And if I if I'm in situations where I feel that I cannot do that, um, and I can't uh, engage mm -hmm. enough to actually change the environment around me so that I can make a difference, mm -hmm. I'll find something else to do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, I think I think you'd find that that quite a lot of people end up leaving. Our professions when when that occurs because mm. um, it is a it is I think it's fair to say it's a fairly self reinforcing culture mm. uh, and one of the things that we're all starting to realise as a consequence of the fact that we need to work in mm. cross disciplinary teams each of our each of our disciplines carry their own set of cultural mores mm. and um, that can be uh, quite confronting because um, if you want to get the um, the creative uh, tension that comes from a diversity of um, trajectories so far, aspirations and outlooks and all that sort of stuff, you've got to be able to deal constructively with the fact that there is creative tension there. Mm -hmm. um, and that means not pretending that it doesn't exist and it also means not trying to make everyone be exactly the same, which mm -hmm. kind of breaks the whole point of having mm -hmm. multidisciplinary teams. Uh, and I think if I was to suggest anything that we're going to need to work on over the next 10 to 15 years, mm -hmm. um, that's going to be it. Yeah, yes, yeah, which is an mm -hmm. anthropological and social Challenge Indeed. as much as it is the, the science science challenge. Do you Indeed. find uh, multidisciplinary in your yeah? It looks world? so. I think uh, as, as my career has evolved, I you know used to work very heavily with physicists, and now mm. we deliberately hire people out of the uh, speciality. So mm. mechanical engineers, mathematicians, computer scientists. Mm. I absolutely love it. I mm. you know they completely challenge the way I think. Mm. You know, but I think throughout my career, one of the things I've been I think I've been very fortunate because I've always really known 
that I love what I'm doing right now and as long as I keep doing the best at it, mm. opportunities will come. Yeah. And so I'm a very much in the now person with an eye to the future. Yeah. Um, but along the way, you know, looking constantly about, okay, this is where I want to go to. Mm. I've only got this skill, I'm going to need this. Who's the best person? And then mm. I find out all the good people mm -hmm. and they're like, who's the nicest person amongst yes. those best yes. people? <laughs> and I've just created this like, you know, international group of people that now, you know, we're all good friends. Yeah. And you feel, you know, it transcends the boundaries of a country. Yes. You know, you really become like this community. Yes. So it's yeah. fascinating, it's great. I think it's one of the joys of science. So I forgot to say, I, I was like you, I, um, when I was 13, I absolutely, I decided I love physics. Oh. Um, but I had a very clever teacher that had a parent teacher evening with, with my parents. And they came back from it and said, well, the, the physics teacher said, You're, yeah, no hope for you. You won't pass the exam at the no. end of the year. No, forget physics. And I thought, whoa, wow. you know, the old bull, the red rag to a yeah. bull. I thought, mate, I'm, <laughs> I'm not having that. Yeah. <laughs> but right. I'm sure it was a clever strategy by the yeah. teacher. Yeah. Um, Deliberate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a bit of a, you know, give me a bit of rocket. Um, so so yeah. I, had, I, had, I had a really great physics teacher. Yeah. And yeah. I think I ended up doing physics because he just challenged me constantly. Yeah. He yeah. didn't do the reverse psychology yeah. on me, but, you know. But it's fascinating. Yes. Teachers, teachers make a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. So that was um, from me, someone who then really helped me yeah. in my career because it was someone making a, a comment that made me yeah. energized. So, what about you? To any challenges or, or maybe not challenges, but something great that happened in your career that really helped you? Would you like to go first? Well, I guess for me it was a couple of things. Um, one was uh, the Harry Messel books, Blue Books of Physics, as yeah. science books. I, as a kid. My older brothers and sisters had them, and so having actual access to written material was really mm. important. I guess now kids have access to the internet, but mm. I used to love opening it up and seeing the um, dissected rat that was mm. on the first page, which many people here would probably recognize. Without the formaldehyde smell. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and all the diagrams yeah, in that. So to me, it just opened up this whole world, which I was just completely immune to. Mm. The other one was on telly, was the, um, they used to have the, um, the Sydney University uh, Summer School of Physics, mm -hmm. and I used to love watching mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And also, and Sydney Morning Herald used to have a comic strip about mm -hmm. science. So all those things sort of added up to information I wouldn't have had any other way because mm -hmm. I didn't. I come from a family, you know, an accountant. My mum was mm -hmm. an architect and mm -hmm. educated, but no one was in this sort of science area. So mm -hmm. having access to stuff when you didn't mm -hmm. was really important. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, teachers. Absolutely, yeah. you know, one of the. Um, Nuns at school recognised that uh, um, English and literature wasn't my thing, but mm. pushed me into being involved with science teacher association mm. competitions. So she gave me free access to the science lab. So I used to do all these mm. crazy experiments, mm. and um, and then write up reports and, and put them in. And you know, mm. one year I won seven dollars fifty. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, um, and so and again in HSC I had um, Barry Price who was introducing the Harvard project physics into the education system. And we had, in a you know, Catholic common school, all girls, we had two classes of physics mm. in the early 70s. That's just unheard of these mm. days even. Mm. And it was because it was mixing uh, sort of history of science and, and, uh, and physics mm. in with it. And I just loved it. Mm. And uh, we even had things like how we did Bertolt Brecht's uh, Galileo Galilei as part of our physics mm. was doing a play, you know, mm. things like that. So it was really doing mm. science mm. differently and physics awesome. in particular. Awesome made a huge impact on me. Uh, and also globalising it, so you, know, you had you know, information from overseas in terms of... Uh, well, with, with that, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But the, I must admit though, I, um, seeing um, CSIRO down the road from where I used to live, mm. um, where the radio physics laboratories were, I always thought that was the place I wanted to work. And the reason was because of the interdisciplinary stuff, yeah. that mm. you could work in one place and have exposure to everywhere. So yeah. I can't believe, I've, oops, I've trained yeah. in, in physics, yeah. yet in, um, when they had in Sydney the um, Vivid Festival, yeah. I was giving a talk to a, in a panel session mm. about viruses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. And it's extraordinary how you can you know, sort of engage in ways across all the um, mm. different disciplines but see how you can link things up mm. where you think, for example, I heard at one stage someone doing, uh, looking at nanoparticles in sunscreen and saying, yeah. is this a problem? And someone who was doing wool research and actually developed a method to detect wool research and look at the um, UV sunlight impact yeah. on wool, mm. got them working together oh, and they came cool. up with a whole way, new way of looking at how to measure nanoparticles in mm. sunscreens to see whether they affected your skin or yeah, not. Yeah. And you know, it's those sorts of things where you're linking people up and that's yeah. what I've seen as my job yeah. now mm. and that opportunity of bringing people together mm. and then also linking up, of mm. course, 
internationally because yes. we only do a small part of the world's research. So yes. it has to be international. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, that's a, that's a great uh, segue to innovation exchange because obviously mm. we've been looking internationally for different ideas to solve old old challenges because there are some ideas that are already there and ready. We, that just we only do three percent of the world's research, yeah. so we yeah. have to be everyone's best friend. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, Darvika, we were talking earlier about you know, the fact that you had to teach yourself different areas of science. Yeah. Has that been a challenge or an opportunity, or how have you I seen that? I see both. I think mm. it's um, you know, and I had uh, being also a transition, having a transition from academia to industry was also a big mm. confidence crisis because mm. I didn't know who I was. Mm. Um, and to this day, I still kind of wear two hats and I'm not sure where I fit in. Yeah. At different mm. conferences, I always feel a little bit panicked. Um, mm. <laughs> but I think that's a new role and, and, and I embrace it and yeah. I, I take it on and I, I see it as a way just to keep adding to my skill set mm. so that it means I'm not shaped just one way. It's sort of broad and mm. I can apply it in different ways. Mm. So, you know, um, I think obstacle-wise, we have plenty of them in ourselves and in our journeys, but then also working for a startup means we're limited resource-wise, funding-wise, mm. all those things are always challenging, but mm. it's only allowed me to grow and, and learn, mm. so mm. it's fantastic. Yeah, you know, that's interesting, because I, mean, I talked about the red rag to a bull, in fact, it energises, mm. and, and some of the challenges I think that we face end up energising you, because you go, oh, I'm not going to be beaten <laughs> by that, and I'm, I'm sure you found that on your journey, because you have that goal in mind. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it helps you through that. Yeah, it's motivating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And obviously it helps with the impact, so that was our, the next question is, you know, What's the, how, how do you drive impact in science, technology and, and innovation? What's, what's, is there a secret to it? Is it just how you think? No, it's, it's a long time. I mean, yeah. you know, I keep sort of saying from discovery to actually having a product is usually mm. about a 20 year cycle. Yeah. Mm. We're trying to reduce that and in some cases it's successful and we're beginning to see some of the, the things that are happening from, um, you know, sort of, uh, for example, the um, main sequence yeah, um, ventures, ca capital yeah. venture yeah. thing that was mm. set up through the NISA program. Mm. That's actually for the first time created a place where um, we've got, for example, um, a professor of physics at Sydney University has got his quantum... Yeah, um, um, Q control, isn't it? Yeah, that's mm. right, mm. where they see that as going to be a really big thing mm. and investing in that and helping that go through and accelerate mm. faster. And there's mm. example after example of mm. that. And as a consequence, what we're beginning to see is um, s some of the um, things that have been happening in the last probably uh, five years, a real mm. shift from the researchers in Australia being here, yeah. industry being there, and never the twain shall meet. Mm. And it's getting to a point now where, for example, who would have thought uh, a top physicist in, in, in University of New South Wales also is now an on, uh, entrepreneur with her own company, a quantum <laughs> computing mm. company. And, um, and I know for, for myself too, seeing things go through that 20 year cycle, and we only have about two of them in a career really, yeah, yeah. is, unbelievably um, uplifting when you see my work has led to something like mm. in my case developing electronics that can detect mineral deposits mm. and it's been able to contribute to the economy by you know discovering billions of dollars worth of mines mm. and you know we don't get any of the personal return from mm. that because mm. it's part of creating mm. a, a successful economy mm. but knowing that you're part of the system that's contributed to that mm. is really affirming mm. yeah it's, it's fabulous to have that opportunity well, so I, did, I have to admit one of the things i've been amazed at in australia is how fantastically we perform at the research level mm. and how you know in terms of impact i think internationally we're having a massive impact mm. so we had um two schemes that I really think made a big difference in Australia. So they set up, the Australian Research Council set up a Centre yeah. of Excellence scheme and a mm. Research Fellowship scheme. Yeah. And that's allowed young people to lead at an early age and mm. to work in these highly collaborative, mm. international ambitious mm. teams. Mm. And mm. so I, that's been going since 2003 mm. and across lots of areas of physics, biology, mm. you know, geology, engineering, mm. Australia has been doing fantastically well. Mm. And mm. I see, you know, when I travel internationally, people acknowledge, mm. oh, you're Australians, oh, mm. yeah, you guys do really well. Mm. You guys really support science over yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a very positive narrative that I see internationally yeah. that unfortunately doesn't get out yes. locally. Yeah. And I, don't, I haven't figured out why that is, yeah. because you know, some of the schemes we have, others are now replicating. So yeah. they're trying to replicate the mm. centre of excellence. Mm. They're trying to figure out how to get young people mm. working collaboratively. Mm. So you know, mm. it's fascinating to see that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting the perspective you were talking earlier about how it was great to be able to experiment and push the boundaries 
of science at an early age. It's the same in terms of the giving people a chance to run these yeah, big collaborative to lead things yeah, and build teams age. at a young age. It's, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And, that, I mean, and I guess from that, we can then start to you know, go for new industries. Once yes. we've got that strong research base, yeah, yeah. we're very well positioned to try, mm. try and translate now. Yes, and obviously people such as yourself with your, with your own companies and seeing that in reality. Yeah. Um, how have you found that and you know, what's helped you? Oh, look, it's, well, so the, fundamentally, that strong research base, that yeah. collaborative nature, yeah. um, there is that kind of Australian sense of giving things a go, which I yeah. absolutely love. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just the culture, it's that kind of, at the same time as being collaborative, it's mm. highly competitive. Yeah. And, you know, when people say to me, you know, what is it about Australia that you know, does well in some of these fields? And it's, it's those two things which yeah. you wouldn't normally put together, mm. but mm. that really helps. And then, yeah. you know, just having, you know, fantastic research funding, yes. which yeah. is, all, you know, it's never enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, you know, yeah. what people do with it is yes. amazing. Yeah. So. And then to your point about talking about it, you know, mm. we, we've got to find better ways of talking about yeah. it and getting and the message out there. Exactly, because as you say, globally we're known for it. We are. We, we need are. to be proud of it ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So, Domica, what about you in terms of the impact side of things? You know, trying to find um, you know, how do you diagnose cancer in a, in a better way? What, yeah. What's impact meant for you and what's really helped you to, to drive that? I think for me it's the entire purpose of what I'm doing. Mm. Um, so, trying to shift the paradigm on the way that we screen for a disease that's so common and, mm. and affects so many people. Mm. Um, but also the potential to use that technology for other types of cancers. So it's a really big vision. Mm. Um, and without that vision, because because it's such an uphill journey, mm. constantly battling um, all sorts of things uh, in, a, in a very small company, um, that vision is actually what gets me out of bed and keeps me going. Because you mm. need a hell of a lot of resilience mm. in this space, mm. no matter where, what mm. sort of walk we're in. Mm. Um, and so for me, just knowing what I'm trying to achieve every day allows me to remind myself when I'm going, oh my God, why am I doing this? Why am I getting up in the morning? It reminds, it just recenters <laughs> yeah. me and says, okay, that's why you're doing it. Um, and you know, the more people I talk to about it, the more excited they are about mm. what I'm doing. Mm. And that's what also pushes me yeah. and keeps driving me mm. to do what I'm doing. Mm. I think it's fantastic. I mean, it's a startup company, <laughs> and it re it's real grit determination. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's absolutely. fantastic what she's doing. Yeah. Need more, yeah. more of her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. one of the one of the things about that um, Damika story is that uh, it's a startup, but it's been going for eight years. Yeah, yeah. Yes. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it takes a while, right? Yeah. And so, so there's there's, there's, a, there's a, a sense time, of so. longevity yeah. there. And mm -hmm. what what will happen is that. Um, you're going to go gangbusters at some point. You're going to become an overnight sensation. But in fact, it will have been oh, 10 years of yes. yes. yeah, 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 yeah. No one remembers that part. Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, it happened yeah. yesterday. No, it didn't. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, my wounds there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. So people think it, it happens overnight. That's yeah. one of the dangers for our young people yeah. is that if this stuff happens over. All of us have worked incredibly hard. Yeah, yeah, and it is a long-term yes, thing. Yes, you know, yeah. Dedication. Oh, I remember having a chat with, and I've forgotten the fellow's name, he's a well-known entrepreneur who um, set up 99designs. Uh, from Melbourne, and I went to his talk probably about five or six years ago, and he had had nine startups, and his family had been living oh. on baked beans for you know for ten years, oh, wow. and then Ninety Nine Designs became a you know, overnight success, yeah. and he was an overnight success. <laughs> but you know his family can can say differently, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They've graduated to fish fingers. Instead. That's right, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah. So now here you are in DFAT, so foreign affairs and trade, and as you heard the foreign minister saying, the aid side of things too. Um, I think one of the most amazing assets we have uh, with, within DFAT is the people that we have and the global nature of the, the, the people mm. network we have and the friends that we have overseas. So mm. I thought it'd be interesting to hear from your perspective. You think about foreign policy, so all the things we're doing in our region around foreign policy, making sure that we're you know, building a strong, resilient um, and a, um, a prosperous region. How do you think science, technology and innovation can be used to help DFAT in terms of its goals of you know, building this strength around us? Well, it's a bit like the, um, the idea that you can, um, instead of giving people fish, you teach them how to fish. Yeah. And I think that's really where we have the opportunity. I th mm. um, if you look at, um, say, the Pacific area, they're mm. going to be hugely impacted by just yeah. um, the sea mm. um, floor rising, or mm. so sea levels rising. So how do you deal with that? What, mm. what are the issues relating to um, massive uh, changes in, in increasing extreme weather conditions? Mm. So how do we actually design our buildings and stuff like that in a mm. way which is suitable for their culture mm. and their, their environment? Mm. So those sorts of things need an innovation mm. solution and mm. they need science and they've got you know, a whole lot of issues relating just like we do with disease and mm. as well as looking at economic productivity. Mm. So 
going through and thinking about how we can make this great science we do here as a pathway to having not just aid, as, as mm. the minister said, mm. but actually um, knowledge so that we can be you know, sort of providing aid via knowledge mm. transfer mm. and working out how to do that in a way that's effective, enduring and, um, and something which helps them to make a difference and become independent of it. Mm. Mm. And I think that's where the opportunity is mm. for science. I mean, that's interesting. I imagine there's several ways of doing that. One is collaborative research. We've been talking about you know, mm. collaborative and, and global, so that's one way of doing it. And then the Prime Minister this week spoke about universities and their role yep. in mm. terms of building that strong relationship Correct. because you have all these uh, international students. Mm. Uh, so uh, I indeed, and, and I guess that's the, the, the twin to the, yeah. to the puzzle in the sense that um, if we're actually to decolonise um, uh, aid in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we, we actually need to start to get to the point where there's, there's not knowledge transfer and education mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I mean, it's how, we, it's how our impact as a nation scales. It's also how um, we create a safe and prosperous mm -hmm. region around us. And that's going to only become even more important as you move as we move into the future, because people these days don't talk so much about Asia and the Pacific so much as the Indo-Pacific, yeah. mm. uh, and that's um, that's going to become more and more important in the sense that we're going to need a, a, a tightly knit, <coughs> stitched up um, uh, region around us in in, in every direction, mm. uh, and that has to be more than. Um, where we've started with the innovation exchange, we also need to start to bring um, universities and education <coughs> into yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, um, you know, the first the first vision for the Colombo plan, not the reverse Colombo plan, but the Colombo <coughs> plan, that was part of what that was all about. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it's worth thinking about what that looks like as we move into the future, I think. Mm. I think the other is too, if you look at where as scientists we tend to collaborate, USA, Europe, mm. be growing with China, mm. we don't have, um, a, and a little bit with New Zealand, it's, mm. but it's a, got an amazing innovation and science sector. But um, we don't so much with um, you know, Fiji, Pacific Islands, mm. and um, mm. say Indonesia, mm. and our, our real new neighbours. So. Mm. One of the things that would be really interesting is to rethink how do we actually um, do things so that when we have, say, um, major events such as um, big conferences, mm. we think about having diversity aspect mm. to it, but maybe we should be also looking to say how do we have a regional aspect mm. to it so that we work mm. out ways to bring mm. our, our neighbours in so that because it, it's those meeting points that yeah. create the collaborations. Yes. Yeah. And I know that what might be old equipment for us, because we're you know, sort of really on the cutting edge, might be gold for another, mm. another mm. organisation in a developing um, mm. area. So then, you know, thinking of new and novel approaches would be something mm. that is there for the taking. Because mm. innovation is an impact sport. Mm. It's all absolutely. about meeting, colliding yeah. and meeting, yeah, <laughs> meeting, meeting people. Mm. So, I mean, the women in physics... Um, oh right! Congress I mean, that's going to be really exciting, and yeah. I think that might be a nice, you know, um, uh, say pilot to see if we could do that. So, mm. um, the honest may not realise that we secured in 2020 uh, the International Women in Physics Conference, which brings a whole lot of um, women from and men mm. from all around the world, from about 80 different countries. Mm. We hope to even do more, mm. and uh, and they come here, and um, it's run by the um, International Union of physics and applied physics mm. and it's um, going it's just trying to boost the um, engagement of women in in, in physics mm. and in stem in general mm. and it's been going for some years now and it's run every three years but uh, the thing that's really interesting is that um, our engagement with um, department of foreign affairs has said we want to be involved with this particularly mm. for the pacific mm. nation and the idea will be to bring women here in particular who we can then set up mentoring programs with, because now we've got you know sort of internet, and, and the thing that's really great with um, a whole lot of um, developing nations is they they're leapfrogging on their technology, so they're able mm. to connect mm. you know, digitally, mm. and so the whole opportunity of engaging with them in a way which we haven't done before, mm. and creating a, a, a process to make those connections, mm. I think will be enduring, mm. and also starting mm. up that thing from mentoring through to collaborating mm. through to you know even sharing opportunities mm. Mm. which means we can extend you know that those collisions and you know from my perspective foreign policy is the same foreign policy is about collisions it's about the relationships mm. so and it's all sort of supporting all that and then of course there's the trade perspective so you know from your perspective i imagine you'd love to go global with with your oh, your idea your your startup um, yeah. how do you see you know foreign Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, how, how do you see us helping you with that? We need help with specific regions, obviously places like China which are largely fragmented and mm. we don't have a base there um, and we can go out and try and find our collaborator or person that we want to 
get help from. Mm. But it would be great if we could keep that here um, and have someone here or there that's mm. Australian based, Australian, you know, mm. and can help us retain our ownership in the way that we do things mm. or uh, make it, keep it Australian is the hard thing to do mm. when you've got this sort of technology and you're trying to expand it globally. Mm. Um, you know, we, we think Australia is the perfect incubator to do the, the initial product launch and, mm. and the perfect place to launch the product. Um, but we can't ignore all the other big countries around the world that we would love to be in. Mm. And I think when it comes to um, getting there, it's not always uh, easy, I've mm. learnt, because I definitely didn't have any networks and some of the people I work with still, you mm. know, we're still learning as mm. we go along. And mm. I think for us, we, have, we just need assistance right there to mm. get to where we need to be and we want to keep it astra like homegrown is the, the key issue for mm. us, not mm. losing it and taking it away and then mm. it disappears. Mm. And, and another uh, thing is how to access more money. I mean, I'm, I'm yes. a, I don't know, I imagine you're going to need quite a bit of money down the track in terms of building, uh, <laughs> Always. We will building at some the point. quantum <laughs> computing industry. Well, so I, to be honest, I look at things in a, a slightly different way, so I, that, mm. whilst I worry about that and I have to worry about it, I think um, you know, one of the things I think we undervalue is that international community. So mm. scientists, you know, science is a universal mm. language. Mm. It basically means that there are a group of people that transcend national boundaries. They mm. have to work together collaboratively. Mm. We all know each other internationally. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And so there's, a, it's, you know, for me, I see that as a force for good. Mm. It's a resource. It's very diverse. Mm. Lots mm. of different cultures, mm. you know, different ethnicities, you know, the whole thing. It's really uh, quite a fluid situation. Mm. And I think um, if, you, if you look at how can we tap into that, that's, mm. what, that's what I think. So. Mm. You know, Big Australia of the Year was fantastic because a lot of my colleagues internationally are like, wow, Australia really values mm, yeah. your scientists mm, yeah. here. Mm. And I think, you know, in, in the best of world, mm. you know, it's a kind of a peer-reviewed system. We all mm. look at each other's papers. Mm. We all try and be, mm. you know, as balanced as possible. Mm. But the reality is if you're, if you're reviewing something from another country and you're reviewing a paper from Harvard yeah. as opposed to, you know, Coventry Poly in the UK, yeah. it makes you think of things. Yeah? Yeah. It makes you think slightly differently. Yeah. And scientists do their best to not, yes. you know, not be biased in any yeah, way. Yeah, just look at the science. But mm. if, you have, if you have a country that goes out there and actively promotes the people that are within mm. it internationally mm. um, and, and does that in a way, you know, so for, for example, recently it was at the Royal Society and they had seven Australians were made fellows at the same oh, time. Wow. Yeah. And I was thinking, God, this is amazing. And yeah. so, you know, one of the things we could have done, just a little thing we could have done was have a, a meeting with the embassy there, yeah. invite some of the scientists that we know in the UK yeah. to that meeting and yeah. they would have gone, ah, oh, these Australians really, yeah. you know, they look after it and yes. they acknowledge their scientists. Yes. So simple little things like that can make yes. a big difference, I think. Yeah, I think it's uh, a great opportunity to bring the two networks together, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got this global, this international mm. science, technology and innovations sure. network that all of them come together um, and then we have our network as DFAT. Yeah. Uh, so to bring the two together would be really, really quite powerful. I think powerful. if you looked at most uh, active scientists, they are far too high on the um, Qantas level of yes. uh, status because <laughs> you do spend a lot of time flying around internationally. Yes. And be, because you are part of an international network. Yeah. Yes. So mining that would be really yeah. useful. And also um, understanding for scientists too, understanding the role that, of trade and mm. uh, the sort of trade mm. um, missions that come mm. from, from the department as mm. well as Austrade. Mm. And I know in CSIRO that's absolutely critical because mm. you know, if we're going to be a successful economy, we can't just look locally. Mm. We actually have to look at the global, um, global uh, market. Mm. And, the only, and scientists on one level have an entree to that because mm. we already know a lot of the country just because mm. you know, most of us have travelled to extraordinary places because they always seem to hold conferences and weird mm. and wonderful places. Uh, which is fantastic for meeting people, mm. understanding the different cultures and knowing how to engage. Mm. And so, as you said, bringing that together mm. with the trade side, I mm. think, and, and also from, um, you know, sort of even just goodwill and, and foreign mm. affairs mm. has a, a great opportunity, which mm. I think we could capitalise on. Yeah, I mean, the networks that we have in, with governments overseas, but also with industry mm. overseas to yeah. help make those yeah. connections. Um, just quickly before we get a Q&A, also within DFAT, we, you talked about teaching people to fish. We're trying to build up the innovation infrastructure within the Indo-Pacific. So if you have an idea, who funds you, who mentors you, who helps you get to market, mm. we're really trying to build that because it takes a whole economy to get an idea <laughs> to market. So we're trying to, trying to do that in the Indo-Pacific. Mm. Now, I'm conscious of time, and I do want to make sure we have um, time for questions from the audience. Do we have some? Because um, I can't see them on the screen. Have we got uh, some agreed? As you can tell, we could talk all morning, but I do want to give um, a chance for your questions to come up. It's okay. 
What was your organisational culture like 10 years ago for women? What changes have you made to improve it? How do you wish it was improved? Okay, who's going to... I can, I'm going yep. to start. So, I, um, so mm. interestingly, and this is something I've, you know, I've, I've been fascinated by myself. So I, I have three children mm. and I would have had them over the last 10 years. And 10 years ago when I was pregnant with my first child, there was a general view that now that I'm going to have children, that's it, you know, my mm. career's kind of over. And it was not a negative thing. It was mm. a, you know, this is the natural progression of becoming a mother. Yeah. Um, so in a physics department, a lot of people said, okay, you're going to take a year out and eventually you'll come back in. Mm. And, um, you know, and I didn't want to do that. And mm. I came back in after six weeks and everyone was like, oh, wow, shouldn't you be with your mm. child? Mm. And it was not meant to be negative. It was yeah, just yeah. a cultural change. Yeah. Mm. And so making sure now that we have lots of childcare places, that mm. people come in with their children, mm. that families are visually seen around mm. is a lot more. But in that process also, you know, I've really gone out of my way to bring young females in because I just mm. find that the research in yeah. our labs mm -hmm. work a lot better. Yeah. So actively trying to get out there, yes. uh, bringing young physicists through. Yes. So we actually have, I think, a lot. Uh, three young girls see, in the audience I can see somewhere. Them out there. So they're getting excited <laughs> about the role models they're seeing today. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other? Uh, well, so, so um, uh, sadly, in my disciplines, um, uh, internationally, engineering and computer science are um, the furthest behind of all of the STEM disciplines in terms of things like gender gaps. Mm. Uh, and it's particularly true in computer science, which is really interesting. Mm. Uh, so, so certainly in my disciplines, we've got a, a, a way to go. Uh, you know, we, we start from behind and um, we've got a long way to catch up. Mm. Uh, and the thing that has given me a lot of heart over the last couple of years is that particularly in North America and in the UK, these conversations have really, really taken off mm -hmm. and there's, there's a lot of concentration on it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've just come back from uh, a meeting of the Computer Computing Research Association, which is um, a collection of all of the um, uh, heads of the best computer science departments in America meeting with government and industry and they ran a session called Stop Driving Women Out of Computer Science, <laughs> um, <laughs> which um, was actually chaired by men. So, so you know, the, the, the conversation is evolving yeah. uh, and the, the fact that we are talking about it says that I, I think it's fair to say that in our disciplines it's a little uncomfortable at the moment, but mm. the fact that we are talking about it is a big step mm. ahead compared mm. to 10 years ago. Why? Why, why is, what's the perception? Why are women leaving? Do they have any idea? Uh, it's, it's this issue about the self-reinforcing culture um, mm. uh, and the fact that there are ways of uh, engaging with people that and interacting that, that just um, uh, are not not necessarily welcoming to people who are not of that, naturally of that personality type and mm. want to interact mm. that particular way. Mm. 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 So it's how they, how they interact. Yeah, a lot, a lot mm. of it is, I mean, I'm looking at your whiteboard, it says values and behaviours, a lot mm. of it is about, uh, is about that and it's not, mm. it's not conscious and it's not deliberate. No, no. Um, uh, I'm mm. surrounded um, daily by, by wonderful men, yeah. mostly men. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes I describe it as like it's a sport. You know, your career is and the culture is a sport, and it's sort of it's set up for certain sports that work really well for men. And um, as women, maybe we need to change the rules a bit, which is where I love the startup side of things. Because in a startup, you set your own your own rules. Yeah. I don't know how you, what you've done in terms of culture around women in yeah, STEM. I, your I guess the company. biggest one is well, ten years ago, I was still at finishing up uni, so I can't comment on the organisational culture, but when we mm. built BCAL up, um, again, I was surrounded by male mentors, which has been wonderful. They've been absolutely pivotal in my journey. Uh, but I think it's about harnessing their intelligence and knowledge and all the things and learning and being proactive about all of that, but also staying true to who you are. Mm. And I know that sounds really fluffy, but I think um, mm. I don't completely change um, my personality to fit mm. what they're doing, but mm. I do, you know, being assertive has taken a lot of practice, mm. especially when you're, you know, insecure like me, well, am I a scientist, am I in industry, what am I doing? Um, so it takes a bit of time, but I've got there, and I think I'm still learning to break those molds around confidence, but mm. it, it's, a, it's a, an evolving process, mm. I think. Mm. It's never just mm. going to be overnight. No, no, it does take time. Uh, you've given some great talks, and I actually comment on some of the talks that you've given about how long people predict it's going to take. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, at the current rate, 150 years to get yes. this. <laughs> yes. But, um, Which we're not going to wait for. Oh, no. um, <laughs> I think, look, it's, it's hugely complicated because we are so, you know, I, I say this regularly, you know, what's the first thing we look at when a baby is born? And mm. it's what gender is it? Mm. And um, gender is so ingrained in the way we engage with people. Mm. And it's, um, it means that there's a whole strata of stuff which, you know, socially we have to look at. I mean, for example, 
uh, the last census said that women do uh, up to eight to 14 hours a, a week extra in, in housework than, than males. Mm. So that means that women don't have as much time. And as a scientist, you, you know, usually you write your papers up and do that, you know, sort of it's mm. kitchen, kitchen table work mm. and it's done at night time. It's a bit of a, you know, sort of a, um, a, a religious belief rather than a mm. <laughs> sort of um, a nine to five job being a scientist. Mm. So, um, so that means women immediately don't have as many hours in the day to, mm. to do that just mm. because there's, you know, sort of mm. most women are still, you know, do any, to some extent do it to ourselves mm. where um, don't necessarily share all the equal parenting. They mm. don't necessarily share all the social secretary of life. And, mm. It's, um, and so there's, you know, th there's that aspect of it, so just not enough hours in the mm. day. The second is um, just the whole culture, I think, at the moment where we have created this wonderful culture where there's lots of childcare, there's lots of opportunities for women to make differences, but mm. I think we have to be really careful that we don't therefore say, expect that when some, that there is only one pathway. And I think as Michelle mm. said, that if you have uh, uh, children that you end up um, mm. having a, a 12 month um, maternity mm. leave. Some people will, and mm. that's really important to them, mm. but some people won't. But mm. we have to be able to accept as women to not give each other hard time. Mm. You've you only had eight weeks long maternity leave. Mm. Well, I had 11, yeah. so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Mm. And just to let everyone know, my kids are in their late 20s and they've all grown up from 11 weeks long daycare <laughs> and they're all normal human active individuals. <laughs> so the experiment works. So, so do whatever works for you. Mm. But I, I think that, so there's a whole lot of social things yes. there. And then you look at the unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's fantastic. The um, SAGE program that's been set up is going to be really interesting to see what comes out. They've done, mm -hmm. gone through doing the uh, valuations from each of the um, government, uh, I think it was something like 40 different mm -hmm. organizations mm -hmm. put yeah. in for it. And to see uh, how they're tracking to get a, a bronze award for whether they're doing other appropriate things mm -hmm. to, uh, to try and manage uh, diversity in the workplace. And I think there's going to be some shocks in that. It'd be mm. really interesting to see that how that comes out. But mm. getting research organisations to look at what are we doing, how do we change things, mm. and then actually doing it. Because yes. it's one thing, it's yeah. lovely, pulling out the data, looking at it, mm. and then you say, oh, but it's telling us to do something, and suddenly people say, oh, I'm not sure I really want to give up mm. my leadership role and give it mm. to someone of a more diverse mm. background mm. because it might actually make a better outcome. Mm. So, mm. you know, the individual making changes is not quite there yes, yet. Yes, it's a mm. complex system. I think very the complex. solution It's not leads, like there's yeah, a solution solution silver yeah, bullet. Exactly, yeah, and I'd, I'd love to see a framework. Um, but yes, we're talking about it. We yes. talk, Ten years ago, we weren't, we weren't talking talk about, about it. Yes. If you were, you were seen as some sort of um, person who's out there pushing their barrel. Yes. And, oh dear, here she goes again. I mean, it's a good start, <laughs> but I still think we need that framework so that we can deal with it really strategically. I, mean, um, I worked at McKinsey for a few years, and McKinsey, you're not allowed to walk into a partner's door unless you've got a framework. So I've just, I, I'm sort of mm. trained. <laughs> <to think laughs> framework. But it does make you see the whole complex system in one swoop and you can pick off bits and, and try to change it. Mm. So I really think we need to be But we've looking. come a long way. I mean, when I had my kids, the youngest, I mean, the eldest is 29, but um, there was no long daycare in mm. my area. Yeah. In, mm. This is in North Shore of Sydney. Mm. So it's pretty amazing. You mm. know, things have come a long way. Yes. So there's, you know, getting yeah. to a point where childcare is being built on every corner. Whether yes. we can afford it or not on scientist salaries yeah. is another matter, <laughs> yes. but yeah. that's, that's yeah. a different yeah. discussion. Yeah. So I've had some great experiences. One, I was actually representing DFAT at an ACFID conference on innovation, and it was a panel. Um, and I think I was the only woman. We had to introduce ourselves along the panel, and, uh, and now I'm thinking I'm going to be in trouble because I haven't got any men on, the <laughs> on my panel here. But uh, one of the men next to me said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to introduce myself. I want a woman from the audience to come up and take my place. So he, he actually just refused uh, to be on the panel, which I thought was an interesting mm. approach. And then um, in the... Change. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then in the Camera Innovation Network, we didn't design to, have, we had an accelerator program called the Griffin Accelerator. We didn't design it around um, gender e equality, but we had, I think it was 80% of our founders were female, whereas the national average was something like 16, so one six. Mm -hmm. And it was because we made sure that, we, that there were women mentors, there were women role mm -hmm. models, as well as men role models and men, men mentors. Um, anyway, we could probably talk about that forever. And I think we are um, running out of, out of time. We might do... Um, let me see. What about the role of government? We'll wrap it up with this question. What role do you think the government can play to assist better participation by women and girls in STEM? But I'd also like you to think about, this is going to be your parting comment, one will be about women in STEM, but the other one will be about how can DFAT help you help DFAT in its international agenda? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm.
Okay, right. so who's going to take that one first? Uh, all right, I will pull up my standard soapbox and point out that um, uh, STEM is an acronym, it's not a word, and mm -hmm. it's uh, all too frequently used as a word these days. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the S and the M part of that are science and maths, and they are about um, being motivated by discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, technology is about making things, and yeah. engineering is about solving human yeah, problems point, yeah. to make technology mm -hmm. using your mastery of science and maths. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all that, what that means is that all of those letters come with different motivations. Mm. And if we are going to genuinely uh, change, fundamentally change the way um, that people think about going into these careers, what you can get out of these careers, mm. what your sets of aspirations are, I think we need to be um, more refined about understanding mm. what all of those different motivations yeah. are. Good point, yeah. yeah. And what about how, has there any way you can think that DFAT can help you help My girl, I was hoping DFAT. you, you no. would. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so how can DFAT help me to help DFAT? Um, uh, I think I would go back to some of this commentary around uh, the strengthening our region. Um, mm. and, I, and I really think that if we are going to, to genuinely um, do this, then we need to think carefully about the long run, not very interesting yeah. stuff around education. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the STEM thing, one of, one of the things I've been fascinated about this year, I've been talking a lot to high school and primary school, mm. particularly girls, and one of the things that I hadn't realised is that they are actually, there's a bit of a backlash to STEM, mm -hmm. the actual acronym STEM. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and their yeah. view is, this is, you know, this is a thing of your generation, not of oh, ours, yeah. which is quite fascinating. Yeah. So they're kind of um, getting a bit resilient to yeah. not, not mm -hmm. wanting to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think one of the things I've learned in talking to them is that they, you know, they're all worried about what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, they've got so much diversity of mm -hmm. what they can do now mm -hmm. compared to a Twa day that they're all worried about they're going to miss out on something. Yeah? Yeah. And so one of the things I've realised is it's, um, it's talking to them about skills mm -hmm. yep. yeah. and, yeah. and picking up skills. And it doesn't matter if it's in yeah. science or maths or engineering or if it's design or yeah. playing an instrument or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I've realised is that for them, they just want to know that things are going to be good. If they make yeah. a choice now, it's not going to disadvantage them. Yeah. And so really focusing on making you know, mm -hmm. careers where there's lots of skills they pick up mm -hmm. along the way. They mm -hmm. don't have to commit to something mm -hmm. too soon. That's, mm -hmm. that's something I've really yeah. learned from yeah. talking to yeah. them. Yeah. And the flexibility that science, technology, engineering and maths can give you, because they're going to have five careers by the time they're 40 and that's, 17 that's right. jobs. So. Except, you know, one of the things I have realised is that there are skills that mm. they should just have. So I'm a big fan mm. of making coding compulsory in schools, because yes. yeah. yeah. everyone needs to code. I mean, mm. it's, it, there are certain careers you don't need yeah. it, but in, you know, pretty much, you know, huge numbers of careers are going to mm. need it. So, mm. so my sense is I don't want to miss out on those mm. skills in new technology that's coming. If they, yeah. if they like technology, mm. they've got to get in there and do that. Great. So now, the next question. Okay. Yeah, so this is, for me, it's an interesting question. So that, you know, that whole international community of scientists mm. who are now, a lot of them are looking at translating to companies. I think mm. DFAT can help by creating international forums where mm. Australia leads them internationally. Mm. So at the moment we have this idea we have to lead a conference here. Yeah. I actually think going out to different mm, regions, yeah. leading mm. conferences where we're seen to be the ones that are the right leaders here, yeah. and then bringing in the experts to the field to us. Mm. Mm. Again, giving them that sense that Australia's on the front foot doing something differently mm. Mm. Um, and is, is ahead of the game. Mm. That's a great, that's a good idea, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess for me, when I was at school, I didn't quite understand all the disciplines of science and where they were going to take me because I didn't mm. have parents that went to university. Um, so I think that's really important, understanding the fact that science can be applied in so many different ways. And, mm. you know, I jumped into industry thinking that a scientist should be following a certain trajectory um, and not knowing whether I was doing the right thing. Mm. So that for me is really important. So I don't know whether that's in the form of storytelling like we are today or role models, which mm. is all very cliche, but I I think it's important to break down those yeah. um, those questions, I suppose, that are around science. And I'm only talking about science because that's all I know. Mm -hmm. um, and with regards to the DFAT, for me, again, as a small startup, very limited resources. We have two and a half people, and the rest we leverage, leverage off collaborations. Mm. So having some sort of grant or innovation-based um, something, I don't know, like an exchange program perhaps, with our collaborators would really help because you know we're always running around trying to find the funds to go and see them and mm. get the next project underway with mm. them um, and we've had strong footprint in you know the USA we've worked with people in Ireland um, we've brought a lot of it back home now but we still have collaborators far away mm. and accessing them and being able to see them regularly is a tough key. Mm. Mm. I think we've got some people from the Department of Industry in the audience you might be able to catch up with them afterwards yep there you go Jane <laughs> in the back there so it'd be good to have a chat yeah, with her about sure, some of that yeah thank you. 
Kathy. So I think um, from thinking from government role is at the moment we're a bit still a bit siloed. So you've got the university sector, you've got government labs, you've got state um, mm. state labs, and then you've got industry. Mm. And there's a whole lot of structural barriers. So for example, if I worked in worked in a university, I lose <laughs> all my entitlements, and mm. I'd have to change superannuation. And mm. I actually univers universities have superannuation here, and government government labs have superannuation mm. there. Mm. Um, industry it's all different again mm. so so having some way of mm. being able to manage the movement of staff between um, mm. and, and having programs to look at how we how we can have better movement because I think part of um, what's missing at the moment is the ability to know what is it like to work in a university mm. I've never really worked or in an industry mm. and having that fluidity to know that it's also going, not going to impact necessarily the magic science metrics or, mm. or broadening the way we measure what is a good scientist or not mm. so that you then don't miss out on being able to be successful in some of the you know things like fellowships and stuff like that further down the line. Mm. So I, I think that sort of thing would be important. And there's just one little thing, for example, the L'Oreal for Women in Science Awards, which gives $20,000 to uh, you know, the most amazing women who, mm. uh, you know, they give four of them out a year. Mm. And um, they can use that for childcare, but it goes mm. to their institution. Mm. And so if the, to and be managed through them, mm. but they have to pay um, pay fringe benefits tax right. on that. So yeah. suddenly it's, you know, uh, it yeah, just yeah, makes yeah. a complex Application, yeah. so that then the organisation's not very comfortable about that, or it's an e extra burden to that research, to yeah. their research dollars. So yeah. that suddenly something which was a great opportunity becomes a real yeah. you know, difficulty. So that's just a really nice example mm. of, or an unfortunate example of where a great idea doesn't quite fit because we haven't got all the things in place. Yeah, yeah. And yes. then internationally, I, I mean, for, I think all the things that have been said have been great, and mm. I suppose one thing which would be really good is. Um, as Australia, we need to probably be a little bit more comfortable of saying, great to, com to compete nationally in terms of um, state to state because we, we, mm. we are a federation. Mm. But when we go globally, we have to be sort of a one Australia approach yeah, so that yes. we, you know, the yeah. states just disappear. And if yes. we can do that, it creates complication in the when we, we're engaging internationally yeah. where people say, so is South Australia that little island at the bottom of yes. Australia? Yeah, yes, yeah. And it's yeah. a separate country. And, yeah. and I, I've heard that so many times. It says a lot about people's education in geography. But it's, it's something where you know, we're letting ourselves down on mm. you know, forgetting where the competition is important mm. and when the collaboration is important. Yes, and, and DIVA has a good role there in terms of representing all of Australia through Absolutely. our embassies and yeah, talking about absolutely. the whole of mm -hmm. Australia and the great stories. I remember being in Beijing and San Francisco talking to venture capitalists and they were saying, yeah, we'd love to invest in Australia, but not until it gets its act together and it's a whole country rather than these yeah, cities that are fighting with one another. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a very important message. It is, yeah. yeah. I was sitting next to a fellow with 25 billion US dollars in his venture capital fund, I'm thinking, well, okay, yeah. wonder if we can fix that one. Um, I think the other thing that DFAC is doing is, for instance, working with CSIRO in countries where we help, we're trying to build their economies, oh, and absolutely. we're drawing you into research with, uh, to do collaborative research with the companies uh, in those uh, countries to help grow mm. their capability. Anyway, we are um, over time, and I think we had until 10.45, so there's a bit of time for you to mix uh, with the panel. I think you can see um, there's lots of ways that DFAT and science can, and technology and innovation can be interacting to increase the strength of our country, but also the prosperity um, and the safety of our region around us. So I'd just like you to thank the panel uh, for their conversation this morning.